couple of matters for housekeeping before we get into some introductions. This webinar will be recorded. Your microphones and cameras should be switched off. If they're not off, if you could please turn them off, that would be great. We have SMEs from the Bureau of Meteorology and Air Services Australia Air Traffic Control with us this afternoon as well as guest presenters during this webinar. And I want to take this opportunity first and foremost to thank them for their time and their knowledge that they're going to share with us today. If you have any questions, you can certainly type them into the chat column uh, on the webinar there. And uh, we have a, uh, a fellow aviation safety advisor online who will be able to answer your questions. We'll also have a short question and answer time following the presentation during which you'll be able to ask your questions and have them answered. And uh, then we'll conclude uh, for part one operational overview. So the recording will be available in the pilot safety hub under the topic of weather and forecasting. So first of all, just some introductions. Um, today is uh, just an overview of uh, weather and forecasting, having a look at our legal requirements and how forecasts are made, and also how air traffic control can be of assistance uh, to pilots uh, getting weather updates. Myself, I'll be presenting is, uh, my name is Rob Whittle. I'm an aviation safety advisor out of the Brisbane office with CASA. Uh, following me will be Michael Paik, senior aviation meteorologist from the Bureau of Meteorology. And uh, last but definitely not the least, we have air traffic controller Michael White uh, from the Brisbane Centre. What we're going to cover today in part one is just an overview, general overview and, and a reminder of our legal requirements for obtaining weather forecasts and where to obtain these forecasts from. I'll then hand over to Michael Paik, who will run us through the types of aviation forecasts the bomb issue, including sources they use in creating forecasts, as well as what triggers an update and how these forecast updates are made. And finally, Christopher Hine from Air Traffic Control will talk about how pilots can use the assistance of ATC in obtaining weather updates during flight, the value of ATIS, even if not flying directly to that particular airfield. And if you do find yourself flying into some unforecast weather or, or a diminished horizon, VFR pilots especially, how ATC can be of assistance to you. So starting off, our responsibility as a pilot in command of any aircraft, they start long before we actually turn the key. So prior to any flight, a pilot must study all available information, as well as any other reasonably available relevant weather information for your intended flight that's appropriate to the intended operation, including the current weather forecasts. Now that requirement on the bottom of the slide that you see there, that requirement is contained in the Civil Aviation Safety Regs Part 91, the Associated Manual of Standards, and also included in our AIP as well. So the pilot of the flight must plan the flight in relation to the information obtained, which may include planning for an alternate aerodrome. But really, what does that mean for us in a practical sense? Well, as part of your pre-flight of your pre-flight planning, pilots should have a current appropriate forecasts that you can understand. Now that forecast information, it must include an aerodrome forecast for the departure, destination, and when appropriate, an alternate, and either a gaff at or below 10,000 feet, or a grid point wind and temperature forecast, and also a wind and temperature forecasts. Obviously, the forecast must cover the period for the flight and the forecast for the destination and alternates. They must be valid for a period of 30 minutes before and 60 minutes after your planned estimated time of arrival. Now, the legally replied required planning tool that we can use, uh, that we must use, is on the Air Services website, NAPES. But that's what we need to have a look at. But you can also gain awareness through other tools as well as what the weather could be doing. Some of the tools are pretty obvious and, uh, and some are not. So a webcam at an airfield, for example, will provide an actual picture of the current status of the airport. But just remember, it's pointing in a particular direction if you, you can't see what is behind that particular camera. If you do ring ahead, make sure you treat the information with caution. Remember, the information you may receive may not be totally 100% accurate. With our AWIS and our ATIS, they're really good sources for awareness tools for pilots and the frequencies you can find in the URSA.
So let's now have a quick look at what our alternate requirements are. If there is a TAF for the aerodrome available, if there's cloud that's more than scattered below the ultimate minima, or there's a forecast of 30% probability of fog, mist, or any other phenomena of reducing visibility below the minima, there's a headwind or crosswind that exceeds the maximum for your aircraft, or there's thunderstorms and associated severe turbulence associated with it, you do need an alternate. Now it does say up there the alternate minima. So what is the alternate, alternate minima? So for aeroplanes by day and night VFR, and also for helicopters flying by day and night VFR that are using aerodromes other than in class G airspace, so the cloud more than scattered below 1500 feet. Visibility, eight kilometers or less is our ultimate minima criteria. If you are flying helicopters by day VFR, two aerodromes that are in class G airspace, then your alternate minima criteria are cloud more than scattered below 1000 feet and a visibility of three kilometres or less. Note also that if we use at an aerodrome that has a TAF-3 and our estimated time of arrival is in the first three hours of the validity period of that particular TAF-3, then you don't need to apply the 30 minute buffer periods to that forecast. You may also ignore meteorological conditions described as probable. Now the buffer periods, except within those first three hours of the TAF, um, they apply to the 30 minutes before the beginning of the weather forecast conditions that require destination alternate or carriage of holding fuel also applies to any inter, tempo or becoming periods. When a destination doesn't have a TAF or a TAF-3 forecast, then we must nominate an alternate aerodrome. But when are alternates not required? So as pilots, we don't need an alternate when you are flying within 50 nautical miles of your departure aerodrome, or you carry relevant holding fuel, allowing you to hold for 30 minutes after the end of the forecast weather conditions, or you're holding fuel uh, for the relevant periods for either a tempo or an inter period. If you do come across a forecast that has multiple inter or tempo periods, then plan holding fuel on the most limiting requirement. What happens if we are unable to get a forecast though? So with flights that you can't obtain an authorised weather forecast prior to departure, you may depart provided you reasonably consider that the weather conditions at the departure aerodrome will allow you to return and land safely within one hour after takeoff. However, you must return to the departure aerodrome if you do not obtain a weather forecast within 30 minutes after takeoff. Now delays happen, especially in this day and age. So if your departure is delayed for an hour or more, you need to obtain an updated weather briefing either via NAPES, via the telephone, or if you can't access NAPES or, you, or use the telephone at that particular time, then you can get an update via radio. Also obtain an updated briefing if the delay pushes your estimated time of arrival at your destination outside of the validity period of the forecast. So we've had a quick look at our requirements for our departure, our destination, but what about en route? So our VMC criteria, under 10,000 feet for VFR aircraft, we need a minimum visibility of five kilometres, 1,000 foot vertical separation from cloud and 1,500 metres horizontal separation from, from cloud. If we're flying under 3,000 feet or 1,000 foot AGL, whichever is the higher, we need to remain clear of cloud inside of ground or water with a minimum flight visibility of 5,000 metres and in class G airspace only as well. Also, if we are flying uh, 3,000 feet AMSL or 1,000 feet AGL, we must carry a radio and use that radio on the appropriate frequency. When we're flying in Class D airspace, 
our separation from cloud is uh, 500 foot uh, below cloud and 1000 foot above cloud. And flight visibility of 5000 meters with 600 meters horizontal distance from cloud. Again, for helicopters, for a VMC en route for our helicopters, by day overland with or without track guidance or over water with track guidance from a navigation system, and we're flying less than 700 feet AGL, we must remain clear of cloud with a visibility of 800 metres. If we're flying over water without track guidance at, uh, at a height of under 700 feet AGL, we must horizontal maintain a horizontal distance of 600 metres from cloud and vertical distance 500 foot below the cloud with a flight visibility of 5,000 metres. And finally, for special VFR, so when you are operating under a special VFR clearance, you as the pilot are responsible for ensuring that the flight can be conducted clear of cloud. The visibility is not less than 1,600 metres, 1 1.6 kilometres for aircraft and 800 metres for helicopters. And you operate at such a speed that allows you adequate opportunity to, to observe any obstructions or any other traffic in sufficient time to avoid collisions. So this concludes just a brief overview of our weather considerations and our VFR requirements. And now I'd like to hand over to Michael Paik to talk about the types of aviation forecasts that are available to pilots. Handing over, Michael. Thanks very much, uh, Robin. Uh, good afternoon to uh, to everybody um, this afternoon on, on the webinar. Um, my job uh, today uh, is to do a few things. I guess one is just to talk about what types of forecasts that uh, the Bureau um, sends out. Secondly, how we create our forecast, what, what goes into um, putting a, a forecast together out of our office. Thirdly, uh, what what um, changes in forecast conditions trigger an amendment or how do, we, how do we change our forecast? And lastly, very quickly, how we then disseminate our forecasts. Just a, a quick reminder that uh, in this webinar, we're just going through the types of forecasts. In subsequent webinars, we'll look at how we might be able to read and interpret those, those forecasts. So firstly, what sort of what sort of forecasts and warnings do we issue out of our, our offices? We actually have uh, two offices and three centres. There's the uh, Brisbane Aviation Forecasting Centre looking after Northern and uh, a little bit of Eastern Australia out of Brisbane. We have our Melbourne Centre they're looking after Southern Australia and we also have a, um, a um, hazardous weather unit that looks after um, so, um, the higher higher level um, forecast and probably less um, less forecast that would be that people in this audience would be using. So firstly, the types of forecasts we have, we have the uh, the terminal area forecast, the TAF, um, which is looking at the weather conditions within five nautical miles of a particular airport. We have our GAF or graphical area forecast, looking at uh, the expected weather conditions across a, uh, a large area. We have the GPWT, the grid point winds and temperature uh, forecast. Again, it's a, a quite a large forecast looking at the, the winds and temperatures at different levels. Now, I'll spend a little bit of time in the next few minutes just looking at those three in particular, but just some of the other forecasts that we do put out. Um, there's an airport weather briefing that is sent out twice daily to the major airports, so the capital cities. Um, if you are flying into one of those, that's actually a, an extended briefing where we put into words our thoughts around the forecast, we convey um, uncertainties and uh, and often the uh, synoptics behind what our thinkings are thinking is for those particular airports. Our um, HWU Centre um, send out area Q and H forecasts. This is a Q and H based on the uh, on the old uh, um, area forecast areas like Area 40 for Southern Queensland or Area 20 and and, and the like for for New South Wales. 
The next two forecasts we hope people in this webinar never have to uh, be part of. It's a search and rescue forecast and a ditching forecast. Search and rescue forecasts are issued whenever there's some sort of craft in distress or, or lost and the Joint Rescue um, Command Centre out of Canberra needs to organise um, search and rescue aircraft to go and find or, or recover or, or rescue some, some craft at sea or on land. And, and secondly, the ditching, which again, we hope nobody in this webinar ever has to use, and that's where an aircraft um, loss of power or, or some problem when they're likely to ditch into the ocean. And then within about five minutes, we need to get the, uh, the a, a forecast out for what the sea and the swell and the, and the weather is like uh, for when they do actually uh, ditch into the water. The next slot of there, we've got AirMets. AirMet is a, uh, um, a warning where we have significant weather that falls outside the areas that we forecast on the, on the GAF. SIGMET, um, is a warning for large areas of significant um, and dangerous weather conditions like um, uh, thunderstorms that are more than 100 nautical miles in extent or large areas of fog and, and the like. Aerodrome warnings are there for particular airports around, around Australia where we uh, mostly warn for the um, people like the, um, the, the refuelers or the people on the ground saying there is a thunderstorm in the vicinity um, and so just be aware of that. Uh, wind shear warnings for mostly the major airports around Australia where we're expecting generally like anyone anywhere between say 25 and 30 knots of wind shear in the, in the in the lower levels. Volcanic ash advisories are also sent out um, for those that are traveling much further where there's uh, obviously volcanic ash is a significant hazard to those flying higher. Space weather advisories are also sent out and um, that often affects the HF radio capabilities of, of pilots if they're flying um, in HF range. And lastly, uh, SIG weather charts um, uh, issued out of our Melbourne office, um, where it's a summary of the significant weather um, around Australia. So just only focus on, on the, uh, the three main forecasts that people in this webinar will be looking at. Um, the TAF, the terminal area forecast, it's a forecast of the meteorological conditions within five nautical miles of an aerodrome and in that forecast you'll find um, information about the expected winds, direction and strength, the expected visibility, um, the expected uh, cloud base, the extent and height of the, uh, of the cloud base, uh, as well as any weather um, that may be expected at that port. Most importantly, it dictates, as mentioned earlier, um, the amount of fuel that you are required to, re required to carry. Um, in terms of having an alternate aerodrome um, versus um, inter or tempo um, holding fuel for that particular airport. The example I've got there is one from, that I picked up from Coffs Harbour uh, about a month ago. The graphical area forecast um, provides information over a large area um, on visibility, uh, weather, cloud, uh, icing, um, any turbulence um, expected over that area, and also the freezing level um, at and below 10,000 feet. So this, this um, area forecast is for at and below 10,000 feet. Um, it's provided in a graphical layout um, on the left-hand side of the, of the forecast, and that's split up into various areas. And then a, dis a description of each of those areas is given on the right-hand side. In the example there, we have area A, and, the, and uh, you look at the graphical um, area forecasting, you can see where A refers to, and then underneath the, the, um, the written section, it gives you a description of what you're looking at. Further on the bottom left-hand side of that forecast, there are two important things to note there. Um, for the two area forecasts that have critical locations, there's information about the critical location. The example you see there is from Victoria, and Kilmore Gap is a critical location there, and there's information on that on that um, port, sorry, that uh, area then. Importantly, the other far left-hand side is a telephone number. Um, that is the telephone number if you wish to contact um, or need more information or clarification of forecasts from the forecaster that has written that gaff and is looking after most of the, the, uh, the taps and the forecasts in that area. It's not a media number, it's the actual forecaster um, who, who's put that information out. And it's written there so that if you do need clarification and you do need more information, that you're more than welcome and encouraged to call that number. 
The next forecast that a lot of you will be looking at will be the grid point winds and temperature. And it's uh, displayed firstly in the background as a geographical location and overlaid on that are squares. And inside those squares, you'll see information at various altitudes or heights um, of the winds or the expected winds in that grid point square and also the temperatures um, in, in that square. And those obviously are used for your calculations for your, your navigation um, en route. So how do we how do we come up with how, how we forecast or how, how do we get these forecasts created? Firstly, the grid point winds and temperature um, are fairly much driven by one or two models that, that, that we use. And so they're fairly much um, automated. However, the TAFs and the GAFs and so on are, are very much influenced by, um, by what the forecasts are doing and each forecaster individually writes those. What we do is at the start of a shift and all the way through the through the shift, we are looking at um, the past, the recent past conditions and also the current conditions. Um, and we use a lot, we use a lot of sources to get the information. We're looking at radar all the time. Um, our radar that we have in the office looks in three dimensions, not just two dimensions. We have very um, quite detailed satellite images that are quite high resolution. We're looking at all the different observations that are coming out of the um, aerodrome um, or the automatic weather stations. We're also looking at where lightning is is forming and the like. So all of this information we're looking at and we're we're observing and then we ground truth we look at how does how does what's happening now and what's recently happened how does that compare with the the model data that we have and we do look at quite a number of different models and then we can ground truth which model is performing better or which models are performing better which are, are performing poorly and the like and then as a result of that we can then um i guess bias our, our upcoming forecast based on what, what model or models are, are performing um, better. So when we come to physically write the forecast, um, what influences us are, one, what's happening now? How, how, is, how is it going now? Two, what is, what is our, our model data saying is going to happen over the next 12 to, to 24 hours? Again, biasing towards the, the models that are performing better at the moment, and that changes from day to day. Secondly, it also we, we base our um, our forecast also on our knowledge on of meteorology, on the synoptics, and how we expect systems to evolve, um, not only at the at the surface but also in in the upper atmosphere. And lastly, we also take into account our local knowledge of individual airports. So, model data. Um, will often not just pick up all those lo those local little um, details that that we're aware of. Um, I can pick on one just for today, the Brisbane Airport. Um, we have a sea breeze and land breeze inter interaction every day. Um, and well, not every day, but on, 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 a, on a number of days. And our knowledge of which direction that's going to come in and the timing that that's going to come in will influence our, our forecasts. So that's, that's, how we, uh, that's how we come about creating our forecasts. Now, as that um, as the shift rolls on and, and we continue to look at our, our forecast and look at look at the information that's coming in, all the uh, the weather that that we are watching, we then can amend or change the forecast based on on what we're seeing, particularly if it falls outside of what we are expecting. So, firstly, air mets. Um, if we get um, any any thunderstorms, anything that's causing extensive areas of low visibility or lower cloud that falls outside of where we have forecast on on the gaff then we issue an air met to alert users that okay you might have looked at the gaff but we have some we have some extra information there's something that's occurring outside of the area that you might have planned on if we have um, whether that is large in extent and is is dangerous as mentioned earlier then a sigmet is issued they are generally for large areas of thunderstorms um, or severe turbulence or severe icing, then a SIGMET is issued. Then we come down to our, our local local level um, for a, a TAF location, an airport location, when we're looking carefully at the, uh, the forecast conditions and the actual conditions at a particular air, um, aerodrome within five nautical miles. We send out an amended TAF or a changed forecast if a number of things are different to what we are forecasting. And I'll look on the screen, you'll see there's there's a number of different dot points there. These are just these are probably the main criteria that we um, are required to change forecasts. For example, the first one where 
the wind that we are forecasting is more than 30 degrees different than, than we have forecast. Um, but that's just when the wind is 15 knots or more. Secondly, if the wind strengths and, and, and the wind gusts are, are more than 10 knots different, um, again, when the winds are a little bit stronger, more than 15 knots or more, if we have some visibility changes that change through the minima, um, or in fact, it also have a changes through other values like 5,000 metres, 3,000 metres, 800 metres and the like, we are required to change the forecast. Anything more than scattered cloud is important um, to all, all pilots. Um, if we have broken or overcast cloud that's below the minima or in fact below other values like 1,000 feet, 500 feet, we change the forecast. If we get thunderstorms or other um, significant weather events like fog that are occurring early or later or forecast to occur early or later, um, changes in temperature, um, oh, sorry, turbulence. Interestingly, we have to change our, um, our TAF or amend our TAF if our temperature that we're forecasting is more than five degrees out, particularly important when it's very, very hot for density altitude. And when our QNH is um, two hectopascals or more out, then we also need to change. Again, QNH vitally important to, to making sure the altimeter is set correctly, um, as well as the meta um, as you're approaching and landing. And then there's a, 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 a catch-all phrase that we have in our operating manual that if there is something else that is operationally significant. So that can include things like, um, as I mentioned before, if our, if our winds are more than 30 degrees out, if the winds are more than 15 knots or more, but if our winds are 180 degrees out and they're 10 knots, we don't actually have to send out a, um, an amended TAF, but we often will because that's, a, that's quite a significant change because it will generally mean that it's a runway change for um, anyone approaching. So that's our amendment criteria. Lastly, and, and, and quickly, I guess, um, how do we send our, our forecasts out? Um, so all of our forecasts and warnings are sent out from the offices that I, that I mentioned earlier, both in Brisbane and Melbourne, and they're sent to air services and they are up, uploaded on um, to NAPES. As, um, as Rob mentioned earlier, that's uh, the required um, place to, uh, to get all your forecasts from. But then all of our forecasts and warning are also displayed um, on the, the Bureau of Meteorology website. Um, you can also see all our meta and species, um, all, the, um, all the information we get from those, the, those weather stations, both in NAPES and also on the Bureau of Meteorology, um, Bureau of Meteorology um, website. And uh, that pretty much um, comes to the end, end of my session. Um, I've got their questions, but I think we'll be looking at that a, um, a, a little bit later and when it comes to, to op open the floor. But at this stage, I'll um, be happy to hand over to, to Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Chris Hind. I am one of the national check controllers uh, for Enroute with their services. Um, and I'm gonna uh, help guide you through uh, the ATC side of uh, weather. So once you actually get in the air um, is where we can help you out. There are three facets uh, to our in-flight service. There's the on request, the automatic broadcast, and then when ATS initiate uh, the flight information uh, service with that weather component. So we'll just go through each one of these individually. First off, we'll go through the on request service. There's a few different parts of this. Um, you can call up ATC on VHF. Alternatively, you can call HF uh, using the call sign Flightwatch and um, ask for any weather product that you need. If there's, uh, if you decided to change your destination and you need a new TAF, then we're available through the radios, either VHF or HF uh, to provide that service. For our automatic broadcast service, uh, there's a few components to this one. Uh, the First off, there's the AERIS, Automatic En Route Information Service, uh, which we'll get to the next slide. Additionally, for those with HF, there is the Volmet service. This is limited to the larger airports, um, for example, Sydney and Cairns. Uh, for full details on the Volmet one, uh, there's an AIP reference there for you to uh, have a look at. In terms of the AERIS itself, got a little map here. You can see the blue circles. So the blue circles are showing the transmitter coverage at approximately 20,000 feet. And you can see there's uh, squares and more of an oblong shape. The oblong shapes are where the transmitters are. The squares are where you can get a product for. Now, each of these outlets has a different suite of products. If you're out near Mika Thara in Western Australia, you're not gonna get the TAF for Sydney. 
but you will be able to get a TAF for say Carnarvon and Perth. As, as before with the Volmet, uh, there's more information in Ursa on what each outlet has uh, in terms of products for each one that you're flying near. Something to raise here with, the, uh, with these two services, the TAF information is generally limited to when there's significant weather elements within the first three hours of validity. Trying to keep those uh, transmissions down. So if you miss it, you don't have to listen too long to, for it to come back around. Additionally to those, we have uh, automatic weather stations and the ATIS at the aerodromes, uh, controlled aerodromes as well. For the weather stations, the information will be broadcast through the AWIS. Any airport that has an AWIS will have that in their Ursa entry with uh, frequencies, phone numbers, et cetera, that can be used to get that information. And in terms of the ATIS, it is provided at a controlled airport. I want to emphasize it's specific for each airport. So in that southeast corner of Queensland, there's quite a few airports in not much uh, space. Each of those airports will have a different ATIS. The ATIS for Archerfield will be different to Brisbane. And when Archerfield goes home, they will have their own uh, ATIS Zulu be broadcast while Brisbane's will still be going. Now the ATIS is um, provided by controllers where authorised weather observers in the towers and they provide uh, a range of information in the ATIS, operational information at the airport, um, for example, runways and that sort of thing. The important thing for this presentation is the weather. So they'll provide uh, a, a range of weather as you can see there on the screen. And the table we've got here are the amendment criteria. So for example, if the QNH changes by one hectopascal, we will update the ATIS. And in terms of QNH, we always round down. So if it's uh, 1013 and then clicks down to 1012.9, we will change the ATIS so it's 1012. The ATIS will be available on a VHF outlet, which will be outlined in URSA. There may also be the opportunity to call a phone number when you're on the ground uh, to get that before you get in the air. One of the things to uh, I want to raise about the ATIS, sometimes they will contain information on uh, specific sectors and specific weather in that sector. For example, as I've got there on the on the screen, maybe rain showers to the east of the airport, but it's clear to the west. So that might that information may be on the ATIS. As you're passing close to the airport, this information could be useful to you. You might be work, trying to work out, see some clouds ahead, which way do I go? And if you can tune up the ATIS and have a listen, there might be some of that information about what's happening in different sectors uh, from the airport. Uh, to help you get an idea of which way the uh, good weather conditions are. Lastly, we have our in-flight service, sorry, we have our ATS initiated flight information service. So all those products that Michael was just talking about, how they go into uh, air services and NAPES, they will get sent through to controllers uh, at the operational consoles as well, whether they're tower or on, on route approach. We get all sorts of weather products. We get the routine ones, so just your normal TAF, TAF and METARS, and we get the non-routine products, which are the important ones in, uh, for this aspect of uh, our in-flight service. Things like amended TAF, species, SIGMETs, and the AIRMETs that Michael was talking about before. Unless pilots request information, we only pass the non-routine weather information. So if we get a new TAF out at uh, a new TAF out for an aerodrome and it's got thunderstorms, we're not going to broadcast that. If it's an amended TAF with thunderstorms, that will be passed out to um, on the radio. So when we get a non-routine product, we have to determine who is eligible to get the product. And then there's a range of criteria. So we've just got those criteria up here. For an amended TAF and a speci, it's aircraft which we know about and are within one hour's flying time of the condition. If it's for a SIGMET, it's those aircraft that we know about and are within two hours flight time of the condition. It's thunderstorms, turbulence, whatever. People need to uh, replan around that area if they, if they need to stay clear. So there's a, bit, there's a bit more time for that SIGMET. In addition to 
the aircraft that we make the assessment are eligible to receive the product. ATC will also make a broadcast on VHF frequencies that a new non-routine product is available. So if we get an amended TAF um, for an aerodrome, say uh, Swan Hill, the relevant controller will make an assessment on who needs to have that amended TAF directed to them, those aircraft that are known to the controller and within one hour's flight time. In addition to that, they will also make a general broadcast, but only when they receive the product. If aircraft are not known to ATC, so they haven't called taxi, airborne or departure, or they're over that time from, their, uh, fr from the conditions, they're not eligible to have their product directed to them and they won't receive it. Lastly, Michael was talking about air mets as those changes for the, uh, the GAFs. We have some slightly different procedures for these ones. We'll broadcast when we get the product and then we'll make follow-up broadcasts at 15 minutes and 45 minutes past the hour for the next hour. So as an example, I've got there, if, you receive the, if I receive the air met at 0025, I'll make a broadcast then. I set a timer and I'd make another broadcast at 0045. And then I set another timer and make a broadcast at 0115. So for the next hour, there will be periods where that information is being broadcast for the air mets. One thing I really want to emphasise in today's presentation, given it's around weather, is ATS are always here to help. If you're unsure about anything, please speak up. If you think you may need a weather product, call up someone and ask. If you have HF, call HF. If you have VHF, then call VHF. We may not have the previous product when we get a new product in they regularly delete the old product so if you just want to know what's the change to the visibility we may not be able to help there but we can always call up the new product and tell you what the new information is additionally we control some large bits of airspace as well so if you're heading towards some weather and you're not sure how it's going to go um, we, we may have other aircraft that are 50 miles down track that are 30 miles off to the west where it looks like it might be okay. Uh, so if you contact us, we can ask those other aircraft if they, oh, sorry, for an appreciation of the weather in that area. So when I, when I went through uh, pilot training, it was plan the flight, fly the plan. If the plan isn't working, we're the people that are there to help when you're when you're in the air we can provide um, a whole range of operational information we're trained to provide uh, assistance to aircraft in a in a range of situations our aim is to ensure that you get every assistance possible if you're in that um, urgent situation so if it's getting dark and somehow the timing's off with your last light calculations or whatever's happened, or the cloud base keeps pushing you down, we're there to provide help. We have maps, we have all the operational documents. So if you need some information on aerodrome, um, like I'd like to go into this aerodrome, what's the AWIS frequency? Uh, we have copies of Ursa that we can find that. We can, as I said before, we can contact other aircraft for assistance with weather appreciation. Um, we have outside agencies we can contact and we have ready reference to first, last, first light and last light for a whole range of aerodromes um, to provide assistance in determining, uh, sorry, to just provide assistance, sorry guys, yeah, just to help you get there. Yeah. This, uh, our website, Air Services Australia, um, has links through industry info and pilot tools for more information. And uh, there's another link down the bottom there on that uh, presentation to get you some more info. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Turn my camera back on. Yeah, to Michael and Chris, thank you very much for your assistance uh, in the presentation today. Michael, really good to know like, how these forecasts are actually made, that the, the sources that you, the Bureau uses uh, to obtain the information to make the sources. And also good to know that there's some local knowledge too in the offices as well. Uh, that can help with the forecasting. 
Chris, yeah, as you said, I just want to reiterate exactly what you said. ATC is there to help. If you find yourself in a little bit of strife, a little bit of trouble, uh, get on the radio. Get in contact with air traffic control. They're definitely there to help. So folks, I want to thank you for joining us online today. And uh, a big thank you again to Michael and Chris for participating. I trust it has been a good session for you and it's a good reminder of us of our weather and forecast requirements. Don't forget the requirements are also contained in the VFRG as well, the Visual Flight Rules Guide, which is available in hard copy and also online on the CASA website. I'd like to uh, open up for any questions. Does anybody have any questions I would like to ask? See, there's been a couple of uh, questions sent in the chat. And I think they've all been answered, which has been great. Uh, would anybody like to add anything? I think there was a hand up from Neil, Rob. One hand up from Neil. Uh, Neil, if you're still online, uh, ask away. Um, yeah, my question uh, really relates to turbulence. Um, just wondering how much the forecast is from data that you have, uh, or is it really more uh, based on PIREPS? Um, so really, you know, how, how localised can you get it? Good one for uh, Michael, actually. Michael. I'm happy to take that one, Neil. Look, um, in all honesty, turbulence is one of those uh, those difficult areas where unless we receive a PI rep um, or something on ATIS from a, from a tower, it's very difficult to verify whether that, that turbulence is, is actually there. So I will pick up on that point that while um, we, we appreciate people calling us, you know, like if, if you need if you need clarification on a forecast, we appreciate calling that number on the gap so you can get more clarification. But on the flip side, we also appreciate when those um, air reps and those PI reps um, come into ATC that we immediately get them as well. So if there is information there that is um, important to us and that includes turbulence, um, we get them and, and we can react to them. But you're right though, Neil, like um, unlike visibility and unlike cloud and so on, that, that turbulence is is difficult to, to verify. Our, our general procedures, um, we look at uh, the forecast winds over terrain will be a, a big determining factor in how our turbulence is forecast, particularly strong winds on and in the lee of the ranges where we get the worst turbulence. We also forecast um, shear turbulence uh, where we're looking at maybe fairly light winds on, on the ground, um, but particularly um, uh, over a number of places in, in inland Australia where you might be up at 100 feet and suddenly you're, you're hit with like 30 knot winds. So you're going from a very little wind to, to a lot of wind. That shear turbulence is what is included in our forecasts. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Neil. Thank you, Michael. Uh, <clears throat> I saw another hand up. Uh, Barry, ask uh -oh. I'm just looking at the um, visual flight guide and it says, um, an authorised weather forecast must cover the whole period of the flight, and uh, and that's great. Um, they obviously include a wind and temperature forecast and one of the following. And it says for a flight below 10,000 feet above mean sea level, a graphical area forecast, which is great, or a general aviation meteorological, in brackets, GAMET, G-A-M-E-T, area forecast. And I'm not sure of the difference between a, a, a GAF and a GAMET. That's a good question. Uh, in the visual flight rules guide, was it? Yes, on page 77, chapter 2, page 77, uh, the um, three quarters of the way down. Right, I might it's have to get back to part you. Yeah. It's also in the part 91. Part 91. Um, peg, yeah. Maybe Michael can answer that. Um, it's not something that, uh, just to be honest, that, that we regularly look at. And in fact, um, a game met I'm not familiar with. So perhaps that's something we can take on notice um, to, to get back, perhaps. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. We've, uh, we'll have will have your details anyway, so we'll get back to you uh, with an answer on that one. Thank you. 
Uh, any other questions at all? Um, just one with the gap with regards to freezing levels. Um, when it's got two freezing levels, so one 5,000 north and then 4,000 south, how, how do you know sort of where that freezing level changes? That's actually a, uh, an, an, an excellent question. Like the, the graphical area forecast, the GAF is is really broad brush. So to to jump through the, the freezing levels um, from here to here to here is, is, ext is extraordinarily difficult. We do find that when that situation is around, we do get a number of phone calls just to clarify, um, to say, look, I'm flying from here to here. Um, what is a freezing level in, in that area? Um, I've personally taken a number of calls about that, particularly um, when I've got people in in IMC, you know, who are flying IFR, trying to work out their 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 safe minima. Um, but yeah, look, it's because it is such a large area. Um, it is it's quite a broad brush. So if it's really if it if it's critical for your operation, then I'd recommend just um, give us a quick call. Great, thanks, Michael. Martin, uh, hope that answers that all for you. Uh, Charles. Yes, uh, I may make a comment uh, rather than a question. Um, the di most difficulty I have when I'm trying to read a forecast is the use of abbreviations. And I'd like to make the comment that in these presentations to suggest that the presenter use the, use the full language instead of the um, abbreviations which just introduces a hiccup for me while I'm working out what that abbreviation means I've, I've, I've lost the rest of the sentence. No problem Thanks, Charles. Charles. Yeah, thanks for that, that's uh, good feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions, folks? Martin, do you have another? Oh, no, see you. your hand's gone down. That's a good one. Uh, Martin, do you have another question at all? Question is actually my first question. With the, I'm a flight instructor and I find it very difficult. Uh, with the students just don't really understand the gaff. The first thing they don't understand is when you're splitting up sections, let's take section alpha, for example, and then you split it into alpha one, alpha two. A lot of pilots don't understand, and I guess I'm not 100% on this myself, but whether when you talk about section alpha, does that also relate to alpha one and alpha two and alpha three, for example? I know that when you start talking about what's going on in alpha one that is specific to alpha one but when you refer to alpha does that also refer to alpha one two and three and so on yeah thanks Mark. i can answer that one yeah um and and again this will be the the subject mostly for of, of the next webinar where we we look at how we interpret um each of these forecasts but in in short okay. um your answer is yes um, if we if we're talking about section alpha, then the weather that we describe um, is contained in the entire um, alpha, including the subsections alpha one, alpha two, etc. Yep. Okay, I'll watch the next step webinar too. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Leave me to it, Michael. Thank you. Given the time uh, that we currently have now, uh, might have to wrap it up, unfortunately. So again, thanks folks for joining us for today's webinar. The recording will be made available shortly on the CASA Pilot Safety Hub website. Now, part two of the weather and forecasting series will be held at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Stand Saving Time on Tuesday, November 8. Now, part two, as Michael just alluded to just then, we'll look at how to read and interpret the weather forecasts. So that includes understanding the GAF, uh, and also understanding the synoptic charts, charts and the role that weather has played in aviation incidents and accidents. Uh, once again, uh, participation in this particular webinar uh, will be from the Bureau of Meteorology and also the Australian Transport Safety Bureau.
Thanks once again.